All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So I know that we were supposed to talk about CDC and this uh, Delta variant and, and the vaccines and everything. However, I think it was important. There is a cool bean, a skip, who sent me a study about the proof that Epstein-Barr virus is reactivated in 30% of the long haulers. So I thought it was important to actually connect these dots as well. And Skip had actually kindly shared that. So today's lecture, credit of Skip, credit to Skip. And the discussion today is that I'm going to present to you a few studies that show that 30% of the patients of long COVID actually are suffering from reactivation of EBV as well. And the authors have a conjecture that in such patients, the symptoms of fatigue, myalgia, hematological issues, cardiovascular issues, neurological issues, and the other uh, issues with the vascular system are because of the EBV reactivation. So that leaves a question in our mind, and that is, can we then treat it? Can we attack the EBV side? So I know that I have done one discussion, and we lucked out that Ivermectin kind of a thing will help there. In addition to that, there are some other possibilities as well, not 100%, but some. Of course, steroids would help as well. But in some cases, steroids can become bad for EBV. Why they can become bad for EBV is that when Epstein-Barr virus is active, it is already reducing the B cells. And on top of that, if we add steroids as well, then immune system's capabilities are reduced further. So we'll look into what are the possibilities and, uh, and the choices that we can make to treat Epstein-Barr virus. Once again, I would say the summary, there are patients of long COVID that have reactivation EBV and a possibility of good drug to use is ivermectin. So with this, let's start. So here are the links that are present in the description as well. This is drbean.com. So if you wanted to watch these videos and more, they are getting transferred on drbean.com. Plus we have a lot more um, medical lectures here as well. So if you see, these are <laughs> the lectures here. Okay, so next, this is the study that Skip sent over. And this is what I'm going to be talking about. Study, here are the authors. So Jeffrey Gold, Ramazan A. Okie, Warren E. Light, and David J. Hurley. All of them, except Ramadan, all of them are from US. Ramadan is from Turkey. So that is the credit to the authors. And here is the study that I'm going to go over. This study, in turn, refers to some other studies that are here. For example, this one, Epstein-Barr virus-associated hemo phagocytic and lymphohistiocytosis presenting with acute sensory neural hearing loss. So one of the, one of the outcome with EBV reactivation is neurological symptoms, including hearing loss and tinnitus. So that tinnitus or tinnitus that patients of long COVID sometimes experience, that is, according to these authors, possibly EBV infecting the inner ear and causing these symptoms. So here is that um, study. Then there is this study as well. Sudden hearing loss following infectious mononucleosis, possible effect of altered immunoregulation. So in this study, they're talking about um, the immune cells. Of course, you know that EBV downregulates immune cells, especially B cells are damaged and T cells can be downregulated. So what happens is that allows the EBV itself to enter the brain and go and um, infect the mid, uh, inner ear. Then here is another very important thing, psychosocial risk factors in the development of infectious mononucleosis. So the question is, why does EBV become active in such states? So EBV can become active for many reasons that include psychological stress and physical stress. Any stress on the immune system plus any psychological stress can flare up herpes viruses. 
and that includes EBV. So this is that, that study. And then here is the EBV DNA. So the DNA of the Epstein-Barr virus increases in COVID-19 patients with impaired lymphocyte subpopulation count. So what they are talking about in the study is that when the lymphocyte counts are reduced in Epstein-Barr reactivation, then the DNA of that virus, Epstein-Barr virus, can be seen in the blood or serum. So these are the uh, references. Now let's look at the study. So here the study's credit or today's lecture's credit. Go <laughs> so I hope that Skip does not become upset. I think this is a cool bean. So this is Skip D and the credit goes to them. Now here is the study. There is a, here is a summary of the study. The study is published on June 17th of this year, 2021. They had 185 patients of COVID. Out of those 185 patients, what they saw was that 30.3% or 30% developed long COVID. So this is also a very interesting thing to note that out of 185 patients who developed COVID, 30% became long COVID. So this is now a proven structure, at least with this size. This You can say that it's a smaller study, but still, I think it's relatively okay. Then out of those who became long COVID, 66.7% had Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. So think about it for a second. Out of everyone who develops COVID, 30% will develop long COVID. And out of all who develop long COVID, 60% of them have Epstein-Barr reactivation. Compared that to the control, so they had a control group of 20 patients and only two of those 20 had reactive Epstein-Barr virus or infectious mononucleosis. So the difference between these two groups was statistically significant. That is why the data that we are seeing here is valuable data. So what was their finding? Their finding was long hauler symptoms may be due to the Epstein-Barr virus reactivation instead of just simply SARS-CoV-2 causing those symptoms. So that means SARS-CoV-2 and Epstein-Barr actually can create overlapping symptoms. They can augment each other's state. And in addition to that, reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus can then drag a patient out in a long COVID state as well. So that is the conclusion. Now with their study, the same authors, so if I go to that study for a second, if you see here in this study, they go, go over the study, they talk about various data points, and then what they do is they in turn, so these are various symptoms, or sorry, the um, aminoglobulins. Then they talk about the most common Epstein-Barr virus reactivated patient symptoms. And look at this, fatigue, insomnia, headache, myalgia, confusion, weakness, rash, and so on. Majority of them are actually Epstein-Barr virus caused. But what I want to show you is this. They have then referred other studies that have shown the connection of the Epstein-Barr virus with COVID. And this top study here, Chen et al, 2021, this is the one that we discussed yesterday. And in that study yesterday, I had made a conjecture that possibly long COVID may have EBV reactivation as well. So then Skip sent over this, this uh, study, which actually shows that it is actually true. So here are other studies too, which I'm going to go over in a second. So there is this study, Paolucci et al. from Italy, and they also observed Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. Then Lenner et al. from Austria, they also saw EBV reactivation. So I'm going to go over that data as well. And then finally, if you look at these, I'm going to go over this as well. And there are 
some more points that I would make those points in the discussion. If I go all the way to their conclusion, their conclusion is our results indicate that approximately 30% of COVID-19 patients report long COVID-like symptoms after acute disease. EBV reactivation may occur soon after or concomitantly with COVID-19 infection, including after initially asymptomatic phase. They actually saw three patients. This is a, a very important concept. They saw, I think, three or four patients, they said, who were actually asymptomatic and then became long COVID. And we have been discussing this over here that it is possible to have long COVID after asymptomatic um, COVID. And the reason they saw was that these four patients had Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. So again, it's a very important study. I'm grateful to Skip for doing this. So let's go over the studies that they have mentioned. So this is Chen A. All study that we discussed yesterday. 55.2% of the hospitalized patients had EBV reactivation. So we saw that in detail yesterday. So that's one. Then, Paolucci A. All from Italy, I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. What they did was that they compared two groups of patients, one group in ICU and the other group in sub-ICU. So they had, in Italy, what they had done was they had created sub-intensive care units where they would provide support, respiratory support or other support before anyone becomes ICU bound. And many times they would hope that they would be discharged from sub-ICU. So you can think of this as patients in the ICU are more severe and patient in the sub-ICU with the respiratory support were less severe. So Paolucci saw, all, the, the team saw that patients who were in ICU, they had patients who were in ICU, 95% of the patients in ICU had EBV reactivation. So 40 out of 42 of their patients in ICU had EBV reactivation. Not only that, they again had EBV DNA present in the serum. What does that mean? When the Epstein-Barr virus is replicating in the cells and it is in lytic phase, that is it is breaking down the cells, then what's happening is that a T cell become active, the cytotoxic T cell, and they start killing the B cells in which the Epstein-Barr virus is growing. So when the T cell would break these B cells like an egg from inside the B cell will come out the, the still developing babies of Epstein-Barr virus and their DNAs would spill out. Those DNAs can be then seen in the, um, what is that, seen in the serum. I just realized, I hope I am able to relay my sound. Um, so today we had the person over who was cleaning. So can you hear me? Or have I gone on for some time without any sound at all? So M. Gregory is saying this is like a scary movie. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, France had T-cell making omelette. That means you are, you are able to hear me. Okay, so back here, sorry. Um, this is a new setup and so because of that I become, um, so anyways, back here. So EBV DNA is observed in the serum of the ICU patients, 95% of the patients. Then on the sub-ICU, so kind of a little less severe patients, still on oxygen, these patients, of course, here instead of our oxygen tank, the invasive ventilation may be possible as well. I just drew one picture and copied it on both. So in the sub-ICU, 83.6% of the patients had EBV DNA in their serum and EBV reactivation. That means the more patients who have EBV reactivation, they might end up in an intense state. So that's a very interesting study. Then here is the study from Austria. Lenner A. All 
2020, Austria, what they did was actually these researchers were trying to figure out if there is cytomegalovirus reactivation or activation or co-infection with COVID or SARS-CoV-2. That's what they wanted to see. But instead of CMV, they ended up finding EBV. So researchers started off to say, you know what, we think with SARS-CoV-2, patient would also have cytomegalovirus. And they came back and they said, actually, we found that with SARS-CoV-2, the patient had Epstein-Barr virus viremia. Viremia is the virus present in the blood, blood system or serum. That is actually a dangerous state. Once the pathogens start running around in the blood, that can cause severe issues, can cause sepsis, and can cause death. So viremia was seen for EBV. So here, they wanted to see CMV, but they found out EBV. What they found was 78% of the COVID-19 patients who were in respiratory failure and were on invasive ventilation, mechanical ventilation, they had EBV viremia. 78% of the patients on ventilator had EBV viremia. So CMV viremia was observed. However, this was nothing more than the non-COVID patients in ICU with the CMV activation, meaning CMV was nothing different from other patients as well. But COVID patients had EBV in 78% of the patients. Now, what else is interesting? So then the researchers continued and discussed that how did we know, these researchers, that we have a reactivation? And for that, they said, we looked at three markers. Number one, viral capsid IgM. And we had this discussion before as well. We had it yesterday as well. IgM is an indicator of acute activity of a virus and acute response to the virus. And usually IgM is seen to be high in levels when we are going through an acute primary infection. Although when the reactivation occurs, it is possible that some B viruses, some B cells will respond to this virus as a new virus and they would start making IgMs. So IgM is seen plus early antigen B diffused is seen as well, but this is IgG. So they said we saw three markers. The third one was the DNA of the virus itself in serum. So these three indicated to them. So look, EAD, actually, we have done this discussion before as well. A level of EAD increasing means that there was a past infection of Epstein-Barr virus, and that virus is now getting formed again. And because of that, early antigens are formed, and those antigens have antibody against them. This is an example of a virus becoming active from latent stage. Similarly, IgM's presence is an example of acute infection. And DNA of the EBV's presence means there is EBV and active. So that is one. Second, this is important. They said we have seen and they have referred other studies. They said, from the other studies, we know that when EBV becomes reactive, not SARS-CoV-2, when Epstein-Barr virus becomes reactivated, it causes urticaria, granuloma, annular, folliculitis, um, cryoglobulinemia, and Raynaud's. These are skin conditions, skin rashes and conditions. And they said, we are seeing those conditions in COVID patients as well. They said that we even saw one, co one case of EBV reactivation in a 16 years old girl with COVID toes, and she had EBV reactivated in her. 
so that is a second proof or evidence or dot they are connecting third ebv related tinnitus ebv related tinnitus and hearing loss i just showed you those studies is proven from the past studies and we also know that covid long haulers may have tinnitus and hearing loss so it is possible that it is because of the co infection or reactivation of ebv and then ebv in turn causes tinnitus and the hearing loss so this is the third point that they made their fourth point is that ebv reactivation is known and they have they have linked studies to go read them they said this reactivation is known ebv to cause cardiovascular issues for example myocarditis inflammatory myocardiopathy myocarditis means inflammation of the heart muscle myocardiopathy means pathology of the heart muscle myocardial infarction we all know that is heart attack and hematological disorders with ebv and neurological disorders with ebv why do i keep repeating ebv i don't want us to connect the dots with sars cov2 we are talking about ebv reactivation causing symptoms in sars cov2 that we usually attribute to sars cov2 and the authors are saying that these are possibly because of epstein barr virus what does that mean for a doctor what that means is that when we are treating long covid we should not only think about how to treat sars cov2 or inflammation caused by sars cov2 we should also think about can we manage epstein barr as well and for that they have given a few drugs that may be tried so that means long haulers may try those drugs too so then they talk about epstein barr virus reactivation is associated in some cases with the multi organ failure including the failure of liver renal system blood system and respiratory system so a coactivation would make sars cov 2's pathology even more dangerous because it would augment it now what are the medicines that they feel could be taken and if let me just very quickly show that area so here so this is a paragraph extended administration of valacyclovir is known to reduce the frequency of ebv infected b cells and has been theorized as a treatment to eradicate ebv from the body so that means for covid long haulers and severe covids or even mild covids it may be interesting to add these drugs just to keep epstein barr viruses activation or reactivation or co infection under control spironolactones have been found in vitro to inhibit ebv vca viral capsid antigen synthesis and capsid formation so it it blocks the formation of the viral capsid so these may be added as well and they are saying spironolactone is also being studied as a potential therapeutic for sars cov2 infection and they are saying that possibly the researcher probably think that spironolactone have some target on sars cov2 they are saying that possibly giving spironolactones is actually helping keeping ebv under control and that is how it is helping sars cov2 infection and then the third one is the treatment with janis cyclovir or jan cyclovir an anti herpes virus drug that blocks the replication of ebv reduce the risk of death in patients with severe disease so there is this study here as well so this is beautiful so i made little cartoons here so valve cyclovir so this is a valve <laughs> sitting on a bicycle or unicycle so valcyclovir spironolactone i always call spironolactone like a spiral and jan cyclovir so this is jan 
sitting on a cycle. This is the discussion for today. Let me just very quickly see um, if there are any comments, and then we'll do some chit chat as well. Correct, Arun. I see your question. Yes, cool. So let's do let's do this. Please do me a favor. Um, will steroid therapy for long haul exacerbate EBV if reactivated? Yes, it is possible. And this is why some people do not respond to uh, steroid very well. Um, Louis, Louis Grande says, will steroid therapy for long haul exacerbate EBV? Yes. Um, let me just quickly. So it is possible if this is EBV reactivation, which may be in 60% of the patients, at least in the case of, according to the study, then yes, they can be exacerbated. Um, there is a question. Dr. Bean, will vaccine cause a cytokine storm? No, vaccines cannot cause a cytokine storm. Yesterday, somebody had asked this question that can a vaccine cause EBV reactivation? And somebody else responded to say no. Actually, any stress on the body can reactivate EBV. That could be a stress caused by a vaccine. Cool. So let's do this. Let's meet again in a chit chat and we'll do some more discussions. Um, so Dr. Sumit says, I've seen rashes to a great extent in COVID these days. Couldn't it be EBV? So uh, Dr. Sumit, I hope you're saying, could it be EBV? Yes. So if you look at, I intentionally did not show those uh, pictures because they are copyrighted pictures. But if you go to this, this study, I'm going to just very quickly go over them. Again, credit to the authors. But if you see, they have the skin rashes and the pictures here, which are EBV-related pictures. So with this, <laughs> let's start for now. And I'm going to come back for a chit-chat. Please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you like this work, please also support this. There is a link to use PayPal to support, or you can buy me a coffee, or you can be a patron. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in a few minutes.